Hey guys, welcome back to or welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Cheyenne Alton. Now today's video let's dive back into the world of Harry Potter, this time discussing where the movie went wrong. So with that out there, grab a snack, a drink, a blanket, and let's get into it. So in today's video, I am taking a look at the Harry Potter movies, more specifically where they went wrong. The movies aren't canon where the books are, so I highly recommend and suggest reading the books as well. While the movies are amazing and I hold them near and dear to me as they are my childhood, they are merely adaptions of the books with so many things changed, added in and left out. So let's get started with the one that pisses me off the most. Jennifer Molly Weasley, or as everyone else knows her, Ginny Weasley. I have mentioned this in a past video, this will be linked down in the description below and in the card somewhere on screen. The movie ruined Ginny's character for me and a lot of other Harry Potter fans. In the book, she is the embodiment of a fiery redhead. She is interesting. Sure, she had a massive crush on Harry still, but she was more than that. She was funny, she was out there, she was strong and brave, and she was a very powerful witch. The movie just doled her down. Yes, she was more than just a love interest. Because she basically had no personality in the film, it actually makes it feel as though hers and Harry's relationship came out of nowhere and was out of place. Whereas in the books, this is definitely not the case. She is helpful, strong, and witty. She's seen being kind to Harry, sending him the singing dwarf for Valentine's Day, the get well card when he was in the hospital. In the books, it makes sense for their relationship, and it feels natural. Not to mention, she was literally possessed by Voldemort in her first year at Hogwarts for Merlin's sakes. This thought to her becoming a fighter, a stronger witch, and wiser. We see her confidence especially grow when she and Hermione grow closer and become great friends. We learn in the Half-Blood Prince that Hermione helped Ginny to become more herself around Harry with this passage from the chapter The White Tomb. I never really gave up on you, she said. Not really. I always hoped. Hermione told me to get on with life. Maybe go out with some other people. Relax a bit around you. Because I never used to be able to talk if you were in the room, remember? And she thought you might take a bit more notice if I was a bit more... myself. Smart girl that, Hermione, said Harry, trying to smile. I just wish I had asked you sooner. We could have had ages, months. Years, maybe. But you've been too busy saving the wizarding world, said Ginny, half laughing. Well, I can't say I'm surprised. I knew this would happen in the end. I knew you wouldn't be happy unless you were hunting Voldemort. Maybe that's why I like you so much. Hermione doesn't know everything. I'm going to let that sink in. I know that must be a massive shock to a lot of people, but a prime example of this is in Chamber of Secrets. In the movie, she knows what the term mudblood means, and is the one explaining the term to Harry. But guess what? In the books, she actually doesn't know what it means. She guesses that it is bad based on everyone's reaction when Malfoy calls her mudblood. But guess who tells Hermione what it means? Ron. That's right, he's the one explaining what the term means to everyone. The filmmakers try to make Hermione the perfect character, wise beyond her years, intelligent, calm. This in the books, however, is not true. By trying to make her character perfect, they also took other characters like Ron's proud moments and gave them to Hermione. And also, she gets the very great privilege of saying Dumbledore's famous quote. In the movies, it is Hermione that says, Fear of a name only increases fear for the thing it stole. In the books, however, it's actually Dumbledore who said this. Hermione in the books is actually sometimes pretty hesitant about saying Voldemort's name. Ronald Billy Weasley isn't that bad. No, I am not joking. In the books, well, he is human, but he is a kind and caring person, also smart and brave. The movie portrayed him as someone, well, as Hermione puts it, 
someone with the emotional range of a teaspoon. The movies have a theme for ruining certain characters, like why do that to the youngest Weasleys, the two youngest Weasleys. Like the filmmaker changed Ron and Hermione's fight at the Yule Ball. In the movies he insulted Hermione to the point of tears and just left her on the staircase crying, whereas in the books Hermione was actually the one to storm off. At so many points throughout the movies they make out Ron to be a jealous friend and a coward and just make him out to be a crappy person in general. Like in the movie version of Chamber of Secrets when they follow the fighters, he can barely speak and is begging to go. But in the book, even though he's still scared, he got over and acted brave like a true Gryffindor. In Prisoner of Azkaban, twice in the book, he was a hero. The first was when Ron pushed Harry out of the way. This was because he thought Sirius Black was trying to attack Harry. Whereas in the movies, he just gets dragged into the Whomping Willow by Sirius Black. The other time was when Ron stood on his broken leg to tell Sirius Black twice that he would have to kill him first before he killed Harry. However, in the movie, this just does not happen. Hermione once again has his moment and is the one protecting Harry while Ron's in the background doing his whimpering. The next thing is the Marauders. Well, the Marauders era. Simply because Lily and Snape are not part of the Marauders. In the book series and even in the movies, actually, they always emphasised just how young Lily and James Potter were when they died. They were only 21 years old. A lot of fans have noticed and pointed out that because Peter Pettigrew, Sirius Black, Remus Lumpen and Severus Snape were all classmates and in the same year, this should mean that by the time they are introduced in Harry's story, they are, or at least should be, in their mid-30s. Yet, in the movies, the actors, although they are great and I love them, they are all perfect for their roles. They all look too old to be playing those characters at the time for the given ages that the characters were meant to be. Baltimore's death. Seriously. The big bad. The massive evil. The villain that had been hyped up for years. The death fans waited for. And the battle that everyone was waiting for. And yet, the filmmakers managed to screw up Voldemort's death. In the books, Voldemort is defeated by his own one, the older one, which is Harry's at that point. When he flings the killing curse at Harry and Harry uses the disarming charm with the sole purpose and intention of only protecting himself, the spell rebounds back onto Voldemort as the one refuses to kill a rightful owner. The one kills Voldemort which is possible this time, unlike his original downfall 16 years prior. Roughly 16 years prior. This is because he had no more Horcruxes. This time he is gone for good. His death in the Deathly Hallows is described as Tom Riddle hit the floor with a mundane finality. His body feeble and sunken, the white hands empty, the snake-like face, vacant and unknowing. With the film, however, the filmmakers went with making Voldemort break into the air and out of existence. They chose to make his death a spectacle and chose to stray away completely from the book by putting Tom Riddle in excruciating amounts of pain. In the books, many fans speculated that Tom Riddle's death was written that way to show that at the end of the day, no matter how hard he tried or what he did, he couldn't escape the truth. He was just a mere mortal, a human, so therefore he would die a mortal death. But in the movies, it's like the filmmakers gave in to Tom Riddle's power, giving him the death of someone who wasn't human, someone who was supernatural, in a sense. Beltrick Lestrange, Nay Black. Now, while I love Beltrick Lestrange in both the books and the movies and Helena Bonham Carter's performance at Beltrick was amazing. The movies again went away from the books. Because the fans and the people who made the film loved Beltrick so much, they added as much of her in the movies as possible 
including putting her in scenes that she wasn't originally a part of. This can be seen with the Battle of the Astronomy Tower. In the book, we see the following Death Eater present for it. Amicus and Electo Cowell. Draco Malfoy. Carbon Yackley. Sorfin Roll. And Gibbon. And no, I haven't forgotten Finrear Greyback. I just do not include him to be among the Death Eaters there, because he was never officially a Death Eater. More an ally so that Voldemort could use the werewolves in the Battle of Hogwarts. As you can see, Bellatrix's name isn't on the list of Death Eaters there, because she wasn't there originally. She was added in by the filmmakers to add as much of her character as possible for the fans. Another place where the filmmakers went far away from the book, The Half-Blood Prince, is when they added in the scene of the Weasley's family home, the burrow, burning down. This never happened in the books. This is because the burrow is meant to be one of the safest places for Harry, after Hogwarts, that is. But because this scene only happens in the movies, there are no repercussions. They literally just got their house back the next day. None of their stuff was lost, no trauma, and they have just moved on with their lives. The scene only added more screen time for Bellatrix and to add more tension between her and Harry. In this scene during the movie, Bellatrix is seen running through the long grass and dancing. While yelling in a sing-song way, I killed Sirius Black, I killed Sirius Black. Adding more pain for Harry and putting more tension there. Adding more fuel to the fire. The fire being that Harry wants to avenge his late godfather, Sirius Black, who did die at the hands of Bellatrix in the previous movie and film, which was The Order of the Phoenix. Charles Charlie Weasley. Where the hell was he? For someone who had some pretty significant roles throughout the book series, it left a lot of fans, myself included, disappointed by the fact that he wasn't in any of the movies. Apart from that one photo from when the Weasleys won 700 galleons in the annual daily profit grand prize galleon draw and went to Egypt. He also got a small mention in Philosopher's Stone. In the books, there was a lot of him. We see him at his brother's build wedding to Flora Delacour as his best man in the Deathly Hallows. We see him at the beginning of Goblet of Fire when he returns home to the borough to attend the Quidditch World Cup with everyone else. While there, when the Death Eater disturbance happened, he, Bill, Arthur and Percy helped the Ministry with attempting to stop it. Then he also stays at the borough until it comes time for everyone to head back to school and he actually assists everyone in getting to King Cross Station on September 1st. We see him again at Hogwarts for the Tri Wizards Tournament later in Goblet of Fire, where he and the other dragon trainers are bringing the dragon to Hogwarts for the first task. Charlie was also a member of the Second Order of the Phoenix. During his time at Hogwarts, he was a prefect, the Gryffindor Quidditch captain, he was a seeker. He also fought in the Battle of Hogwarts, although he showed up later on in the battle towards the end. He brought with him the foreign recruits he had gotten whilst in Romania. He led them into battle, helping everyone that had been fighting beforehand. George Weasley talks about Charlie's involvement in the following quote. Charlie's in the order too, but he's still in Romania. Dumbledore wants as many foreign wizards brought in as possible. So Charlie's trying to make contact on his days off. During Christmas in 1991, Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, well, Ginny, went to visit Charlie. For someone who seems to have such a massive role in the whole Harry Potter storyline and helped out so much in so many ways, pops up so much and is around for important moments, it leaves them wondering why such an important character wasn't included in the movies. Apart from a few small mentions here and there, and one small sighting of him, which is the family photo from the Daily Prophet of their holiday in Egypt. 
Dumbledore's death, how the movie Half-Blood Prince screwed this up, I will never know. In the books, Dumbledore's death takes place in a chapter of the Lightning Struck Tower, which we actually get a forewarning to in the chapter The Steer Overheard, when Professor Trelawney tells Harry about the warnings that Dumbledore has been ignoring all year, about what the cards keep showing her, and about how she keeps pulling out the card which has the Lightning Struck Tower on it. The card meaning that calamity and disaster are coming nearer. So at the beginning of the chapter, The Lightning Struck Tower, we see that Harry and Dumbledore are returning back to Hogsmeade after recovering what would turn out to be a replica of Slytherin's locket from the cave, which is the title of the previous chapter. When they're about to mount their broom to get back to Hogwarts, they see the dark mark in the sky. In the movie, Trelawney's scene is cut out completely and the cards are not mentioned once, despite the fact that they were actually correct all along. And a dark mark wasn't cast until Dumbledore has already been killed and it was Bellatrix that cast the spell. In the book, Harry is immobilised in the corner of the room and under his invisibility cloak, so he cannot interfere or try to protect Dumbledore. Whereas in the movie, he is walking around on the floor below, watching the event through the gaps in the flooring. And surprised, he hasn't got his invisibility cloak. Also, during Dumbledore's death in the movie, we see Harry raising his wand to try to help his headmaster. Except he doesn't get a chance, because as luck would have it, Snape shows up right next to him, mentioning with his hand for Harry to be quiet. That is before he makes his way up to the floor, sits above Harry and kills his headmaster, sending him falling into the courtyard. However, in the book, this doesn't happen. Dumbledore tells Harry upon arrival at the castle to wake up Snape and bring him to him. Nothing less and nothing more. But before he can do this, the Death Eaters have other plans, making Harry retreat into the corner before being, you know, immobilised. Though in this scene, in the book, there is no interaction between Snape and Harry. In the book, when Draco is meant to kill Dumbledore, he doesn't, which leads to Dumbledore just talking to him as if they are friends. Draco admits to poisoning the mead that he thought Slughorn was giving to Dumbledore for Christmas, but instead Ron ended up drinking it and getting sent to the hospital wing with poisoning. He admitted to getting Rose Murder to give Katie the cursed necklace in the hopes of it getting to Dumbledore. Once again, it nearly killed another student instead of Dumbledore. Whereas in the movie, we only see Draco saying that he had to do it or the Dark Lord would kill him. So anyway, that is today's video guys. I hope you liked it and comment down things in the comment section about where you believe the Harry Potter movies went wrong. This is just all the things I can think of at the top of my head. But I'm sure there's much more that I can would probably think about in a much more in-depth thing. But if you can think of anything else that I haven't mentioned or anything that you thought was really interesting that was changed or left out or added in, please comment it down below and I'll get back to you. And yeah, I hope you guys liked this video and until next time, I love you. Bye. And make sure to check out some of my other videos on this channel as well. Sorry for keeping you longer. But um, I do have some Harry Potter related videos, I'm pretty sure. And yeah, so check out my videos. It really does help a lot. And subscribe. So anyways, this time for you. I love you guys and I'll see you next time. Bye.